Hello, fellow artists. This is Linda Riddle, and it's a good time for art. Color is one of the most powerful and also one of the most complex elements of art. Most of us have strong feelings about color. We probably have a favorite color, and we may find that certain colors affect our mood. Some colors might make us feel excited and energetic, and other colors might make us feel calm and relaxed. Advertisers have even found that certain colors can make us feel hungry. That's why McDonald's uses red and yellow in their signs. Today, we're going to just begin to scratch the surface of exploring some of the qualities of color that we can use to our advantage as artists. Artists and scientists have been exploring color for hundreds of years. I'd like to introduce you to a couple of artists who explored color in very different ways. Vasily Kandinsky was a Russian artist who is sometimes called the father of abstract art. His paintings from 1910 are considered to be among the first completely abstract compositions in modern art history. Kandinsky thought that artistic experiences were all about feeling and different colors affected mood. He believed that realistic images detracted from the true meaning of an artistic work. He was not making pictures of people, objects, or landscapes. He combined lines, shapes, and colors to create his compositions. Kandinsky taught for many years at a famous art and architecture school in Germany called the Bauhaus. A younger teacher at the Bauhaus was a German artist named Josef Albers. Albers was influenced by Kandinsky's ideas about color, but his paintings were quite different. He was especially interested in the relationship of colors to one another. In 1933, Albers moved to the United States and continued to paint and teach for the rest of his life. He favored a very disciplined approach to composition. For over 25 years, he worked on a series of paintings and prints called Homage to the Square. Each painting consists of either three or four squares nested within one another. By using this simple composition, he was able to focus on how individual colors interacted with the colors around them. This little chart is called a color wheel. A color wheel is a tool that artists use to help us understand color and how to use it. A color wheel has all the colors of the rainbow arranged in a circle. The first color wheel was designed in 1666 by Sir Isaac Newton, the very same scientist who we know for his work on the law of gravity. You might want to research how he studied light shining through a prism to develop his theories on color. So now I'm going to simplify things a little bit because when you're looking at all of those different colors it can be a little bit overwhelming. Sir Isaac Newton came to the conclusion that red, yellow, and blue were the colors that you can use to mix all the other colors. So these are called the primary colors. And what I've done is I've made a little triangle here with pencil and I've put one of the primary colors on each of the points of the triangle. If you want to make your own color wheel with paint, you certainly can. What I'm going to do right now is mix all these different colors with each other to see what colors we can come up with. So if I take my yellow and my red and mix them up together, I should come up with an orange. And so I'm going to take the orange and put it between these two colors and I'm going to make 
I make the circle a little bit smaller because I want the primary colors to be the biggest. If I take yellow and blue together, I should get a green. And you know, it makes a big difference if you put a whole lot of yellow or a whole lot of blue, you're going to get a different kind of green. That's why we had so many different colors on that first color wheel that I showed you. Also, I am going to confess to you that when I was in elementary school and we did color wheels, I was often really frustrated because a lot of the times the colors wouldn't come out as nicely as I would have liked. And I've come to the conclusion that the problem is not with the person mixing the color, but a lot of times it's a problem with the paint. So if you don't come up with a beautiful violet when you're trying to mix violet, it's probably that you don't have the right red because there's so many different reds. So don't blame yourself if that happens, just blame the paint. Okay, so I've made some green and I'm going to put it between the two colors that I used to make it. And now I'm going to mix some violet, which seems to be the most difficult color to get the way I want it. What I might do is add just a dot of white because the color is so dark that sometimes you can't really see what it is. I put a little white in there. You can kind of get more of a feeling of violet. So make yourself some kind of color wheel. Uh, this one was just made with watercolor paints. Or if you don't even want to mix the colors, just maybe take some markers and put your primary colors down. Just make some sort of simple color wheel because we'll be using it as a tool. Now, if you're a very young artist, don't bother making a color wheel. Just have the adult in your life provide you with the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, and give you opportunities to mix them up and see what you come up with. But for the rest of us, we're gonna be using these little color wheels whether they're fancy or whether they're simple, and relying on them to figure out some ways that we can understand more about color. Josef Albers explored the relationships of colors to one another. Let's use this color wheel as a tool to explore some of those relationships. First, let me just remind you that red yellow and blue are the primary colors. And the colors that we get when we mix primary colors are the secondary colors. So violet, green, and orange are secondary colors. The colors that are next to one another on the color wheel are called analogous colors. And usually when they're used side by side, the result is a feeling of, of harmony because the colors are very close to one another. They have something in common. For example, violet has blue inside of it. Green has blue in it. So 
using analogous colors is one way to create kind of a harmonious feeling. On the other hand, the colors that are across from one another on the color wheel have a very different kind of relationship. These are called the complementary colors. And this is one reason why I love having a color wheel to use as a tool because you can just make a line across if you can't remember what is the complement of yellow? Oh, it's violet. What is the complement of orange? It's blue. The complement of red is green. You just make a line straight across and you can figure out what the complementary color is. Something fun about the complementary colors is when you put them together, instead of just this gradual harmony that you might have with analogous colors, you almost get a vibration. The colors are so different from one another. I'm just going to put complementary colors on top of all of these colors in the color wheel and show you what I mean. So this can come in so handy when you are doing a work of art and you think, wow, I want to really have an impact in this one area. I want the colors to really pop. And you can depend on your complementary colors to help you out for that. One of the things that Josef Albers talked about was the fact that every color, even if it's the exact same color, it looks different depending upon the color that it's with. And you can see that when I put this same violet on top of all these different colors. When I do exercises like this, it helps me understand how someone could spend over 25 years painting boxes of colors inside of other boxes of colors. Because when you think about it, there are hundreds, thousands of different kinds of reds, thousands of violets, thousands of blues, and then you start overlapping them over one another. There's just an endless variety, and I can understand why he was so fascinated by exploring that aspect of color. Collage is a great way to explore the relationship of colors to one another. It's really fun to take the same colors, like I took green and orange, and I put them on different colors of backgrounds. You can see that on the red background, the green, which is the complementary color of red, really vibrates and, and really shows up. That very same green, when it's put on top of blue, is very peaceful and calm and just sort of blends into the background. But the orange, which is a complement of blue, really pops on this one. So it's, it's super fun to just take a piece of paper and put some shapes on that are analogous and some shapes on that are complementary and see what kind of results you come up with. You can even get a lot of variety by exploring different shades of the same color. This is, these are both shades of orange. This is a yellow orange and this is more of a reddish orange. And I've used the very same colors and shapes on top of these. And on this one, since it's kind of more of a yellow orange, the yellow is much more subtle and kind of blends in and the red jumps out. Whereas on this one, since it's more of a reddish orange, it's the yellow that jumps out at us and the red that kind of recedes. Now I'm going to switch gears and explore color in a more playful way. I'm going to be using liquid watercolor you can get different brands of liquid watercolor paints. And 
I'm just going to be using them very loosely on different kinds of paper to see how primary colors mix together. This is watercolor paper that I'm using right here. And I'll just let that dry and see what happens. It's going to keep changing as the paint dries. This is a different kind of paper. It's called uh, color diffusing paper. And we'll try that and see how it comes out. This time I'm using bingo bottles filled with liquid watercolor and I'm just gonna splat them down. I can sort of draw with it too if I want to. We'll leave that to dry and check it later. Big coffee filters also make great diffusing paper and I like to use them to make sort of a little tie-dye circle. So I'm just folding it up. I'm going to put it on a paper plate and start squeezing some color on there. I want to make sure the color goes through to the other side. Now when I open this up, I should have a really interesting design. And one thing that I like to do sometimes is to take it a bit further. And if I've got a lot of paint on my coffee filter, sandwich it between two pieces of white construction paper and just rub on it really hard. and make a print. Actually two prints. One activity that everybody loves is liquid watercolor spray paint. I just take the watercolor and pour it into a spray bottle. You can dilute it a little bit if you want to, but I like to use it straight to keep the colors really strong. And I'll let my friend Van demonstrate how to do spray painting. is Van's exuberant spray painting. It's just an energetic explosion of color. I love to see all the different colors he made just by spraying with red, yellow, and blue. Look at all the greens he got. And there's a little bit of orange in here. I see bits of violet in places. Spray paintings are so much fun to do for people of all ages, and they're beautiful to look at just as they are, but they also make absolutely wonderful gift wrap. So if you have a birthday present you're giving to somebody, I recommend doing a spray painting. In one of our previous classes, I made a collage by cutting up one of my spray paintings and gluing it down to a piece of cardboard. So that's something else that you might want to try. Here's one of the experiments that I did with the color diffusing paper. And I think this would be fun to cut up and make into a collage as well. It was fun for me to see all the different colors that developed at, after the paint dried because it, it keeps on changing as it dries. So I've got myself a little bit of orange, lots of green, and bits of violet in here. I also decided to try doing some various squares inside of squares the way 
Joseph Albers did to try to understand the relationship of different colors. And it's really interesting for me to see how they change depending upon the colors around them. Thank you so much for joining me today. Share your color explorations with all of us at hashtag GoodTimeForArt. In our next class, we'll learn even more about how we can use color to our advantage. I release a new video on the first and third Monday of every month, so be on the lookout for the next one. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's it for today, but remember, it's always a good time for art.